everybody. Welcome to my home in Tel Aviv. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here with me. And for those of you that are new, welcome. And those that have been with me before, so happy to have you back. And here on this wonderful day, I am thrilled with two wonderful friends that are going to be joining me here. But before we start and before we meet our first one, Molly Sugarman, I just want to go through little technical things. One is there are comments uh, on the Facebook page. And if you have questions for Molly or myself, please write in there and we will do our very best to answer them. Number two, please stay to the end of this event because I have a wonderful, wonderful guest at the end who is a singer and songwriter, and she will share something very special, and we have a special announcement. And number three, in honor of all of you who are discovering or have discovered your Oasis, Heart's Landscape ebook is free all day on Amazon. With that, I get to introduce one of the most compassionate, sweetest, kindest, souls that I have met on my journey. Oh. And this is Molly Sugarman. Hi, Molly! Hi. <laughs> and Molly is the clinical director of NIBRA's patient empowerment program. And just listen for that. Patient empowerment. So you already have a little bit of a hint of what Molly does. Molly and I met, I think it was about 14 years ago or something like that. And one of the doctors at the um, practice where Molly's program occurs, Dr. Israeli said to me, Susan, what are you doing these days? And I said to him, well, I'm a spiritual counselor and I'm privileged to work with people. And at that time, it was only women that are touched by cancer. And he said, wait, you have to meet Molly Sugarman. And I said, why? He said, as soon as you meet her, you will know. And lo and behold, Dr. Israeli, thank you for that because you were quite intuitive. And as soon as I met Molly, we shared a very similar heart language. And the, I guess the biggest word that came into place was healing with compassion. And so I am going to say hi, Molly, and introduce you to everybody. And I would like you to share, Molly, a little bit um, who you are and about this unique program. Oh, well, Susan, thank you for the privilege and such an honor to be here today and and to have forged a relationship with you for so long. Um, uh, I'm the clinical director of our patient empowerment program, and this in NIBRA plastic surgery functions as an integrative approach and truly believes that you can't separate the emotional from the physical component of going through the process of uh, mastectomy or lumpectomy, whether it's for cancer diagnosis or as a result of for risk reducing purposes. Uh, it has made a dramatic impact on the patients and we see how their healing and restoration is directly affected by having these tools available. So the tools are uh, from the time, uh, at the time of consultation, I meet all the new patients and that's the beginning of my relationship with them and I share the tools of the program that are available to them and their significant others at that time. So I remember when I met you, Molly, you said to me, Susan, you have to come do a workshop. And I came and my first workshop that I did for your amazing souls that were in your program was about tapping into joy in the midst of a storm. And I have to tell you, that is where Morning Inspiration was born, really, because I remember telling the women in the group about that I was sending these blessings to my friend who had been touched by cancer. And they said, why are we not getting these? Right. And, uh, and um, until today, many of those women are still in my Morning Inspiration family. And I have forged a wonderful relationship with some of them. and. They continue to inspire me every single day. And um, so I thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, I know, including my daughter, who still <laughs> subscribes to it. Um, oh, what an <laughs> honor. 
Um, may I start off with using one of your pieces of writing? Absolutely. Okay. I, I, in looking through and having the pleasure of looking through your book, this particular piece spoke to me, um, and I hope I do it justice in, in reading it, Susan, so I hope you'll excuse me. Um, one morning, afternoon, or evening, you just got it. The freedom of realization occurs. What is of importance and what is not? You'll learn the liberty to care less about what others think of you and more about what you think of yourself. You just get it. Your entire being can feel how far you've come. You remember when things were filled with such confusion and mess, and you thought you would stay in it forever. And then you smile. Your heart smiles, your soul smiles. In that moment, you are truly proud of yourself and the person you so passionately thought to be. It just clicks. So Susan, this reflects for me the work that you and I do in terms of how we provide tools to assist individuals to come to this point in their journeys. We try to assist them uh, to create order from the disorder of a diagnosis. One doesn't move from on from the trauma of illness, they move forward with it and it becomes part of their story. It impacts all decisions they make going forward. Um, I personally, in my program, um, have it based on the tenets of post-traumatic growth. Um, it's, it's a way to use the experience as an opportunity to really reassess your life um, and to discover what buoys you and what is your oasis. That is so critical. So I thank you for the gift that you've given everybody with, with your beautiful writings. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. The way, first of all, uh, that connection. You know, I, I forget sometimes everything that's in my book. And I love that someone all of a sudden just pops up and said, this is where it met with me. So, you know, one of the things that when I talk to people that have been touched by cancer and they come to me, and one of the things they say, I have no control of this storm I'm in. I have no control. I'm in the storm and, and, and I'm just going like this. Um, and I think the basis to starting when I try to help someone uh, see that they have those tools, they have that oasis, that beautiful thing within them is owning their moment. It's just owning their moment and how empowering that is to know that that one moment that you take and you shape and you create can be contagious to all the moments to follow. Yeah. So I wanted to know what would be in your program, Molly, or one of the first messages you would want a patient to have on their journey to discovering their own oasis? It's a very good question, Susan. Um, I meet with someone immediately after they've seen um, one of our plastic surgeons for consultation, and and they um, are in the midst of such turmoil as if they've been hit by a stun gun. They're hugely overwhelmed, and I think one of the things that um, that runs through um, is a common theme for all patients. Uh, all individuals uh, going through a diagnosis, again, whether it's breast cancer or another serious diagnosis, um, is the lack of control, that sense of loss of control. And what the tools that I provide and the program provides and actually the practice provides um, uh, is, is a way for them to recognize that while there are some things, the diagnosis is out of their control, that they have a control that they can insert as to how they're gonna navigate the situation. Right. So if they're, uh, and, and that is impactful. If, you're, if you know that you can, as you frequently talk about the tool belt, 
uh, given. If you know that you're armed with a tool belt and at any given time you can reach into it and you can pull out one of these tools that will empower you, it changes the whole dynamic. It changes uh -huh. your whole mindset. So, one so I, call it, I call it sometimes a soul <laughs> toolbox or a soul treasure box. And that's exactly what you were sharing, Molly, is that we can have all these things in our tool belt or in our soul treasure box. And at that time, just know, okay, I can open it and I can take it out. And that is going to be my guide for the moment. That is good. And so explain to me a little bit why, why in your office, what would be different than in a support group? in your program? Well, well, this program is a very comprehensive one. And according to this is completing the 14th year, um, I brought the integrative approach to Long Island after I left my private practice about 27 years ago, uh, but created the one here for NIBRA in uh, January of 2009. Um, and um, it brought this in, in integrative approach that provided tools that are simply part of someone's treatment. Uh, in most practice, according to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, this is the only private practice in plastic surgery in the United States that has this model. Um, they, in fact, wow. came here. They had heard about the program during the initial year that I had started it, and they, they flew in for about a week and, and got a sense of the program, filmed various components. And um, sadly, it's the only place where it's that comprehensive. So the various tools are whether it's meeting, being connected to another patient who's had the same doctor, the same procedure. It's is a very strong community of support. They have the option of tapping into uh, setting up an appointment with me for uh, preoperative guided imagery, which is an extremely powerful tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. not unusual for patients to either touch base with me 12, 13, 14 years later and say, invaluable. I use it on an everyday basis. Um, and um, there are support groups that are based on specific needs. Um, I truly believe having been doing this for many decades, we won't talk about how many, but uh, for <laughs> many decades, uh, that this needs to be and is an open program. We don't process grief and loss in any time period or any, any order. And sometimes one doesn't go through all the typical stages of grief. So yeah. to, know, to know that you know, you handle as much as you can handle at any given time, and that maybe three years from now, six years ago, something will open the door to the unfinished business of feelings attached to the diagnosis, and that you can come home again, if you'll excuse me, Thomas Wolf, but you can come home again, is of great comfort to these patients. So there are lectures, there are various groups for lumpectomy, uh, mastectomy, risk reducing patients uh, or initiating one for women who choose to go flat post mastectomy. There's a breakfast meeting for men. Uh, spouses are the forgotten parties. So all of these tools make a difference um, in terms of how someone becomes restored and the mindset of the patient is very dependent upon that. So one of the things that I come across, Molly, is that, you know, patients or people that are touched by cancer will say, I don't want people to look at me as I am a representative of cancer. I want them to remember that I am the same person, maybe not exactly the same because no. we change we change every moment, right? No two moments are alike, so we're not alike in any two moments. I would like to just be able to talk as the person I am with this illness as opposed to the illness talking about me. And so I, many times we rediscover those beautiful things um, that are about that person. If it's that they like to draw, that they like to sing, that they like to dance. I mean, I have to be honest, you know, I, it was we were going through COVID, and I was talking to 
grateful that I am with you. And I danced around the room with somebody because that was going to remind them about who they were. So I always say to them, remember that you're not the illness and the person you're talking to will also understand that. So do you have any tips on that that in your work? Well, I, I think that's a, a very important point. People do not want to be identified, re-identified as their, as their illness. You know, as I'm going to pick any name, as Amy who has breast cancer. They want right. to be Amy who happened to have breast cancer. Right. Uh, and um, it's, I think, one of the important pieces that I work on in, in the process of my groups um, is people really deciding uh, to reassess what they, how they live their lives. Are they saying yes when they mean no? Are they doing the kinds of things that bring them joy? What's getting in the way? Are they paying attention to self-care? Because self-care is not self-indulgence, as many of us right. are taught. Um, and uh, to really use this opportunity, that post-traumatic growth opportunity, to assess their lives individually. And if they're part of a relationship, their relationship as well. I do the same thing with the men. And what I see very frequently is a dramatic change, a dramatic shift in how individuals and individuals within a couple setting change and, and redirect the course of their relationship. It really gives them a chance to take mm -hmm. a pause and step back and really get a sense what do I want? What do I need? What's going to be fulfilling to me? So true, because one of the hardest things that women will say to me is, it can't be all about me and this cancer that I now am part of. I can't ask for help. That's because wow. if I ask for help, then I'm the weaker mother, I'm the weaker sister, I'm the weaker spouse, I'm the weaker friend. And I want to show that, no, I can do this. I'm strong. And, um, you know, I tend to work with them on that, on that. They just have to realize that they're a champion. They're just a champion. Every single day, they're a champion. So there is no weak and strong. You already are a champion. And um, so I, I really wanted to hear from you two things, anything that can be added to someone's soul treasure box, toolbox that's listening or that they know somebody about how do you deal with this? I can't show that I'm weak, so I'm not going to ask for help, especially, especially not only with females. Um, and so well, with I'm curious to hear. Yes. yes, yes. It's interesting that you're bringing that up because I just, um, uh, on the NIBRA website under the blog, I just wrote um, a story on uh, letting go of control. <laughs> um, and it addresses a lot of what you're talking about. Um, I think one of the very key things, uh, whether a whether someone is single or in, in a relationship uh, with a partner, is the importance of making your needs known. People see having to ask for help as a weakness. They see expressing their feelings related to a diagnosis as weakness. Here's a very typical example. Uh, someone in, in, in group might bring up, I thought I was doing so well, and then, fill in the blank. I fell apart. So, and, and I said, well, I'm not really sure what you mean. You fell apart. You fell on the floor. You broke in pieces. What does that mean? And I think what's happened in our society is that we've been taught that to demonstrate appropriate sadness or grief, you know, is a sign of weakness. And so people wear a mask. They feel they need to wear a mask. And the weight of that mask is so intensely heavy. And oh, it really impacts, true. it truly impacts their immune system, their mindset. And um, they don't recognize that, you know, that it is a normal process to allow the grieving, to allow the feeling 
that you're having. And it's not what you've been taught by society. Uh, and it has to be reframed. That is really critical to give yourself permission to feel what you're feeling. You're not going to cry 24 hours a day. You'd fall asleep first before <laughs> you did that. But the reality is permission to feel, permission to, and, and that the sign of strength is letting people know what your needs are, to let your community be there for you. And that's actually where you can take control. You can tell people what your needs are. And people right. really are at a loss. They want to be available. And you don't want 24 macaroni and cheese casseroles arriving at your door. You know, so if you ask for what your needs are, it's a win-win situation. You get your needs met and other people get to do something meaningful for you. Right. So I love that. That's a, I totally work on that, making your needs known. Your, and, and I think that first it's acknowledging what they are, right? We really have to acknowledge and accept them and be with them for a while. And I, I think for, for me, it's, I am always questioning how amazing are these human spirits? Like they just are really, truly um, champions. And acknowledging that they are a champion in every moment of their day is something that is hard for them sometimes to remember. So one of the things that I offer is, you know, we give horseback riders, they get a champion uh, or a ribbon. And so I offer them I want you to tell me three things that you think you're amazing at. Just three okay. things. Right, right. And then tell me these three amazing things. And then I say, but this is even better. You're better at that. So that's why you're a champion. Um, because getting lost in what I'm good at, because now cancer has touched me, sometimes I find is the blockage of asking for help also. Yeah. Yes, is because we're really good at these things and we're not good at that. And that's OK. But if we can acknowledge that we're not good at it, then maybe you can actually do it. <laughs> yeah, but, but there was a there was something else you asked me before about what are their things uh, my patients uh, consider doing to empower themselves um, and I very frequently, I, in my early, my, my first beginning of my career, I started the first formalized art therapy program in New York City uh, mm -hmm. at my Bellevue Psych. And uh, I frequently suggest that someone buys a, um, a journal that's bound, not, not a spiral, because if it's bound and you rip out a page, the, it, the book falls apart, but that you start to document every single day from the beginning of your journey you put the date on the bottom of the page and you put a word a scribble um, a sentence whatever we and not be concerned about grammar uh, at all and um, sometimes the play play the page may be blank but if you do that consecutively every single day and you start to see that you're moving forward emotionally as you move forward physically, because they're all integrated um, and you come upon a day six weeks later and say, you know, I thought I was in a different place and I'm feeling somewhat disappointed. You have something very concrete to go back to, to see how you and, and it's your words your sentences, your feelings that you've documented so you can concretely see your progress and how you've moved forward. So I have something to add to that sure. that um, anyone can do. You don't have to be touched by cancer, but I do it every single morning is I get up and one of the first things I do is I just smile. Even in the most challenging of days and moments and times, I just smile because that smile is a message to my heart, to my soul, to my body. It's okay right now. In this moment, 
I'm okay. Right now, I can experience smiling. Even though people are going through challenges and really hard times, it doesn't mean that they're not allowed to laugh and they're not allowed to smile and they're not allowed to be joyous. And it doesn't have to take away from that at all. You exactly. know, we don't, and that, that also is something that I meet up with many times, that if people see that I'm all giggly and happy and joyous, they're going to think, oh, she doesn't need it. She's <laughs> fine. She's over this. She got this down. And that's not so. And, but we can allow that, right, into those moments and into those times. So I wanted to ask you one more question, Molly. Okay. If, okay. I um, first of all, I'm I'm so happy that you're here, and I get to share you with the world. Thank you. So that's number one. Um, so if you had a magic wand, uh, right? See, sometimes I think in my writings and in my morning inspirations, my magic wand is that I'm throwing out a message to someone somewhere in this universe that needs to get it and perhaps will make their moment better than the one before and will maybe be a basis for making the many moments after better, right? Because we've talked about that. Good is contagious yeah. and joy is contagious. So that's my magic wand as a healer is that I do it through my words mostly and through my morning inspirations. And then when I meet up with a client, but really almost on a daily basis, I'm sending these words out somewhere. So I'm handing that magic wand over to you, Molly Sugarman. And what will you do with that wand? Ooh, we certainly did not prepare for this question. <laughs> no. uh, there are so many things I would want to do, but I think one of my goals is to give people reassurance that I will walk with them during that journey and that they can count on that, that it's that it's something that they can count on in the midst of chaos and uh, that there's a sense of resiliency that we all have inside of us that's so important to tap into and in working with people to try to have them tap in and trust that they will move forward and there will be a time like in your poem that they <laughs> will say i've got it you know uh to mm -hmm. to make this come full circle you know that's the ultimate goal isn't it susan um uh, that, yes. that someone gets to that point so it's not so present in everyone's daily life that you go through a whole day at some point and say i didn't even think about it once that <laughs> is the ultimate um, it it never totally disappears. As I said, it's part of your fiber. It's part of your story. Yeah. And it doesn't take much to, to bring it to the forefront. But the goal is to be able to feel restored and to, to move forward in a way that you feel joy in your life again. Ah, oh. ah, oh, so beautiful. So my dear friend, Molly, if someone wants to be able to have that little bit of magic from your magic wand, how would they find you and where would they go? Sure. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, so I'm, I'm part of the Nibra plastic surgery medical team in Great Neck, New York. And uh, someone can directly uh, get in touch with me through my email at msugarman at nibra.com or to call the office directly and ask for me. And I'll be happy to guide you um, through through the process here. Uh, and um, I wanna thank you, Susan, so much for inviting me and, and, and to have you part of the NIBRA program and to the NIBRA, NIBRA um, you know, journeys of so many women uh, and and to give the gifts that you give to so many, you know, beyond those that you could possibly count. Oh, thank you, Molly. Mm -hmm. And it was my privilege. Mm -hmm. And I can only say, may everybody who meets Molly feel a little bit of that good in their heart thank because you. I do. And um, so now 
I get to invite a wonderful, wonderful soul who is talented in so many ways um, and in ways that I wish I could be talented. <laughs> and um, this is Shira. She is a singer and songwriter uh, based in New York City. Hi, Shira. Hi. <laughs> and um, I've gotten to know Shira, and, but mostly um, her music has always sat with me in my heart hmm. and um, has always moved it and brought more awareness to my moments of wherever I was. And um, so I asked this dear soul if she would share a song and I would like you share, if you'd like to share, share you'd like to share, <laughs> my Hebrew getting in there, if you'd like to share something about this song. Yeah, it's funny that it's getting in there because as you know, Shira means singing in Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I got lucky that way. Worked out for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and um, and I thought a lot about what I wanted to sing for you today. And um, I'm going to sing my song, Am I Beautiful? Mm -hmm. um, that I wrote for a very good friend of mine who at the time was diagnosed with uh, stage 3 breast cancer. And um, as many of you here with us know what that's like, um, she had a lot of changes in her body and she didn't feel beautiful. And um, as a songwriter, I wanted to use my magic wand <laughs> and, um, and try and see, l help her see her through my eyes and be a mirror for her for a moment and show her how beautiful she is to me always. So um, this is Am I Beautiful? Without hair, you are beautiful. Without care, I will hold you in my arms and never let you go. You're beautiful. That's all I know. Am I beautiful with burning skin? You're so beautiful. I don't know where to begin. Your eyes, they shine the truth when there's none to be found. I hold on to you like solid ground And we can be beautiful together Beautiful together even when we're apart And we So beautiful together, even apart. Am I beautiful with a bare chest? You're more beautiful oh, than all the rest. You're chest and your open heart they leave me wanting more you're more beautiful than ever before am i beautiful without breath yes you're beautiful now just rest Now close your eyes, my fearless princess And know that I'll be here Loving you Till my 
very last tear And we can be beautiful together Beautiful together even when we're apart And we will be beautiful together So beautiful together even apart So once again, touching my heart, my soul, and I see touched Molly, and I'm sure everyone that heard you. And um, so I thank you for that. So right now, I think, Shira, it's a good time that we can kind of tell our little fun announcement that we have. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And, and whoever's here are really the first people to hear about it in the world, which is very exciting. Right. <laughs> Yay! And that's because you're all champions. That's right. <laughs> so I came to Shira a while back, um, and I said, Shira, this keeps knocking at my heart's door. I keep hearing your voice with my morning inspirations with the words in my book. And do you think you can maybe compose and sing some of them? And in all honesty, when I sat with you on the pier in New York City, I was, well, if Shira says no, I'm too busy. And I will say, okay, because I always tell everyone I work with, you can ask for something. The worst thing that they can say is no. And so, Shira looked at me without really blinking, I think, and said, yeah, yeah, let's do this. And and since then, for me, it is um, a privilege to know that we're working on this unique kind of a concert. Um, I'm not going to give any more details. Um, You will all know when it happens and where it will be, and I truly hope whoever is in the area will come um, because I think it will be a place of healing, Mm -hmm. a place of joy where all of the magic wands of healers throughout whatever channel they use it will come to fruition there. Um, So yes, we said it, Shira. I'm so excited. (laughs) I look forward to that. (laughs) You do a lot. Yes. So, We're winding down here, and I am really, my soul is lifted after speaking with you, Molly, and having you here, Shira, with me, and ah, I'm (sighs) quivelling, as you would say. I'm like so, (laughs) so full of pride and joy, and I want to thank all of you that came to hear us, and really, you continue to be the inspiration. Ah in so many ways, in so many of my moments. And I wanted to let you know where you can find more about me at susanplax.com and find out about my book and um, what I do and read and listen to my interviews. But before you all go, I usually like to seal a place when hearts meet up with a blessing. Um, So this is my blessing from me to all of you, Shira, Molly, and I want to thank the people, the wonderful people at Book Trip, at Merrill Moss Media that put this together, and to my Neot family who who helped in their way, and um, mostly to all of you that are on the road to discovering your oasis or have because it's there. It just needs an invitation. 
so before you go, a little prayer. May the beating of your heart be a constant reminder of your miraculous being. You, may you rediscover the beauty your soul holds. May your hand stay open to all the desire it's grasped. May hope show up at your door each morning as if it appeared for the first time. May nature continue to offer its unconditional love. May you dance to the music your heart plays so ever sweetly. May you cherish the courage that lives within you. And so on that note, for me, to you, a hug. Bye-bye now.